In this video, we're going to look at chapter 16.6, which focuses on some of the accessory organs of the digestive system, namely the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder. So the pancreas sits behind the uh, dorsal to or posterior to the stomach and extends laterally from the duodenum uh, laterally towards the spleen. So this is a retroperitoneal organ. It sits behind the peritoneum. Only the anterior surface of the pancreas is actually covered with peritoneum. It's an elongate, sort of pinkish gray organ. Its length is about uh, 15 centimeters and it weighs around 80 grams. That's about three ounces. So the surface of the pancreas sort of has a lumpy texture, very soft, it's easily torn. And uh, it is primarily an exocrine gland, but it does have endocrine function as we shall see. All right, so there are two distinct groups of cells in the pancreas. There are these pancreatic islets. The eponym for this is islets of Langerhans, but you won't find that term in this textbook that tries to stick with the Terminologia Anatomica. But these islets are endocrine cells. The islets contain a number of different cell types within their little clusters of cells. They have alpha cells and beta cells and other gamma cells, other, other types of cells. The ones we hear most about are the alpha cells and the beta cells. The alpha cells produce insulin, or sorry, produce glucagon, and the beta cells, I apologize, produce insulin. So insulin from the beta cells, glucagon from the alpha cells. They only account for about 1% or less of the cells of the pancreas. However, they play an incredibly important role. The, the pancreas is primarily, however, an exocrine organ that produces pancreatic juice from cells at these blind end pouches called um, pancreatic acini. And so these acinar cells are exocrine glands. That is, they have ducts that can take them back to an epithelium. The epithelium in this case happens to be the surface of the interior of the duodenum. So these produce a mixture of digestive enzymes, water, buffers, we would collectively call pancreatic juice. And they empty via ducts into the duodenum at the same point at which the common bile duct from the duct that is a fusion of ducts from the liver and the gallbladder meet and travel and enter into the duodenum. The same site is where the pancreatic duct enters. Some, some people have a second duct that uh, branches from the pancreas and still enters the duodenum but at another site. But that's not found in all people. So the pancreatic enzymes do a lot of the digestive work in the small intestine. Here's some of the anatomy. So we can see the head of the pancreas sitting in that C curvature of the duodenum. Remember the first two and a half centimeters or so of the duodenum that leave the stomach, the pylorus of the stomach, travel out through the peritoneum and end up lying retroperitoneal along with the pancreas that travels laterally towards the spleen, the tail of the pancreas. The bulk of the pancreas is covered by these lumpy sort of, uh, has this lumpy texture and is mostly acinar cells. If we were to pull back the covering, so to speak, of the pancreas and look inside, we'd see all these small exocrine glands with cells that secrete the secretions into small ductlets, if you'd like, that travel back and fuse together and form larger and larger ducts. So as they branch, they form larger and larger. Finally, traveling via the pancreatic duct back, into this section you see referred to as the duodenal papilla where it is a fusion of the common bile duct from the gallbladder and from the liver traveling to the duodenum. So they enter the same site. And as I mentioned, some people have an accessory pancreatic duct that's not found in all people. There are also these islets, uh, islets of Langerhans, pancreatic islets, that can contain alpha and beta cells and other cell types that produce glucagon and insulin that travel into blood vessels and don't travel back, back via this duct to the duodenum, but circulate through the whole body to affect, um, deal with sugar, sugar metabolism, sugar absorption, and sugar levels in the blood. The enzymes that are made by the pancreas are these exocrine cells that travel back to the duodenum fall into uh, a number of different classes. 
They're about the pancreas produces about a liter of pancreatic juice each day. Its activity and its secretion is regulated by hormones. We've already seen how secretin and cholecystokinin before. Secretin that's made by the duodenum in response to the presence of acidic chyme entering the stomach and excess proteins or undigested proteins coming in the chyme triggers the pancreas to release alkaline fluid. It, it's rich in a bicarbonate buffer. It's actually sodium bicarbonate. And this alkaline buffer of a pH of 7.5 to 8.8 .8 is going to deal very well with that incredibly acidic chyme at a pH of 2. It's going to neutralize and bring it up closer to 7. It may not become completely neutral, but it may still be slightly acidic, but not nearly as acidic as it is uh, when originally uh, in the stomach. But it increases the pH, i.e. makes it more basic or more alkaline, which is optimal for digestive enzymes. Cholecystokinin stimulates the pancreas to make its enzymes that I was referring to, and they fall into a number of different categories classified by what their substrates are, what they break down. So we have carbohydrates, just a generic general term. It, an enzyme that digests carbohydrates or sugars and starches. In particular, one example is pancreatic amylase. It breaks down amylose. Amylose is a long, uh, long chains of glucose. It's starch, starch in your potatoes, and sweet potatoes, and, um, uh, and grains, and, and whatnot. Pancreatic lipase breaks down lipids, or fats. We have nucleases, because of course when we're eating organisms, whether they're plants or animals or whatever they are, they are made of cells, and cells have DNA, they have nucleic acids, so we have nucleases that help break these down. And particularly important, two enzymes I mentioned already, fall into the category of pancreatic proteases. They break down proteins. These make up the bulk of the pancreatic enzyme production. I mentioned trypsin and I mentioned chymotrypsin. I did not mention carboxypeptidase. But these are all examples of uh, protease. They break down complex proteins into short peptides and individual amino acids that are small enough to be absorbed. Now these enzymes are, are, are quite powerful. Uh, the pancreas itself would be susceptible to its own enzymes traveling in its ducts if it didn't produce them first as proenzymes in their inactive form. So trypsinogen and chymotrypsinogen and so on. And they become activated as they get the right pH uh, when they arrive at the small intestine. Trypsin is one we use actually in laboratory settings quite often. If we're growing a, a dish of, of cells, human cells, a petri dish, in which the cells are attached to the dish, they actually adhere to the dish because proteins in the membrane of the cells reach out and grab onto charges that are put on the petri dishes when they're manufactured. What we do is we actually wash the cells with a buffer and then we add trypsin. And trypsin goes along and cleaves those proteins as they're reaching out and grabbing onto the plate. And when it cleaves them, those cells let go and they float up in the trypsin. And so we, we trypsinize, we collect the cells off petri dishes by using this enzyme, the same enzyme that's made in our pancreas. The liver is the largest visceral organ. Obviously we have our skin, which is the largest organ of our body at all, but within the abdominal pelvic cavity, the liver is the largest organ. It's about 1.5 kilograms, that's 3.3 pounds in weight. It represents approximately 2.5% of an individual's body weight. It sort of has a reddish brown uh, color. And most of the liver lies in the right hypochondriac and epigastric abdominal pelvic regions. So you may need to go back to uh, chapter one to look at the various regions. We divide the body, the abdominal cavity into quadrants and then again into regions. So again, in the right hypochondriac and epigastric abdominal pelvic regions. It is wrapped in a very tough fibrous capsule and it is covered by a layer of visceral peritoneum. The liver is divided into four lobes. They're not equal in size. The left and right lobes are very large. And there's a smaller caudate lobe and a small quadrate 
low. I'll show you some images from figure 16, 16, 14 in a moment. On the anterior surface, there is a ligament called the falciform ligament, and that marks the division between the right and left lobes of the liver. On the posterior side, the thickened posterior margin of the falciform ligament is the round ligament, and that's actually a remnant of the fetal umbilical cord. Now, within the recess under the right lobe of the liver is the gallbladder. We're going to talk about this muscular sac that stores and concentrates bile uh, later in this section, so I'll leave that for now, but you can see the gallbladder there under the right lobe of the liver. So large right lobe, this anterior view, large left lobe. You can't see the caudate or quadrate lobes um, very clearly here in this image, but you can see the falciform ligament that divides these two lobes. And you can see the, on the posterior side of the, of the um, falciform ligament, the round ligament, which is a remnant of the fetal umbilical cord. Posteriorly, you can see the caudate lobe, smaller section, and the quadrate lobe that sits just um, lateral to or anterior to the gallbladder. There are several important blood vessels here. The hepatic artery, which supplies about a third of the blood flow to the liver from the heart, part of the systemic flow. And the hepatic portal vein, which is going to supply the other two-thirds of blood, which is actually coming from the digestive tract, from various parts of the digestive tract, to the liver. And this is why the liver is the first organ to really get to process nutrients from our diet. The lobes of the liver are divided by connective tissue into many, many, many lobules, about 100,000 liver lobules. That's the basic functional unit of the liver. As we're going to see on the next slide or so, shortly, these images from figure 16, 15, if you'd like to look ahead here as I describe the anatomy of the liver. So within a lobule, liver cells, also called hepatocytes, uh, where they're exposed or covered by microvilli, are arranged in a series of irregular plates, almost like the spokes of a wheel. And the plates are only one cell layer thick. The role of the hepatocytes is to adjust circulating levels of nutrients by selectively choosing to absorb or not absorb chemicals as they pass by. Uh, there are these specialized highly permeable blood vessels, capillaries, called sinusoids that form passageway between the adjacent plates and then eventually pass into or empty into a central vein. The lining of the sinusoids has a large number of phagocytic cells called Kupfer cells. They're part of the monocyte slash macrophage system. But these, as monocytes and macrophages do, engulf pathogens, debris, damaged blood cells, and so on. Now, blood enters the sinusoids from branches of the hepatic portal vein and hepatic artery uh, proper. And the, these two branches plus a small branch of a bile duct form what's called a portal area or a portal triad. And this, ha this forms at each of the six corners of a, any given lobule. So as blood flows through the sinusoids, the hepatocytes are going to absorb dissolved chemicals from the plasma and also secrete materials like plasma proteins, albumins, and whatnot that are made by the liver into the blood. Blood then leaves the sinusoids and enters the central vein of the lobule. The central vein of all the lobules ultimately merge to form the hepatic veins, which empty, empty into the heart, into the right atrium, via the inferior vena cava. The hepatocytes also 
produce bile, and this is why connection to a small branch of bile duct is important. Bile is released into these network of narrow channels called bile canaliculi. We saw that term when it came to bone tissue earlier. And these are small passageways between adjacent liver cells. And the canaliculi extend outward from the central vein, and they carry bile toward a network of larger and larger and larger bile ducts, which eventually lead through the common hepatic duct. So any bile in the common hepatic duct can flow into the common bile duct, uh, which enters into the duodenum, or may uh, sort of back up an enter cystic duct that leads to the gallbladder. So blood comes from hepatic artery and hepatic portal vein, hepatic artery from the heart with freshly uh, oxygenated blood or venous blood from uh, the digestive tract into where the bulk of the blood comes from to the, to the liver. So as it flows through, the hepatocytes absorb nutrients, they secrete plasma proteins like albumin, so we talked about it, in, uh, and their role as carrier proteins and binding globulins in the blood. And the blood flows from the sinusites into the central vein and merge to form the hepatic veins and eventually drain back to the heart via the inferior vena cava. So to reiterate, the hepatocytes secrete bile into narrow channels called bile canaliculi. They're located between adjacent liver cells. They carry bile into a bile duct that's part of the portal triad, which then flows to a common hepatic duct and then to the common bile duct that goes to the duodenum, or if the bile needs to be stored, backs up in the cystic duct into the gallbladder. And so you can see these structures here as we look at every cell thick is one lobule. Right? So you have many lobules here. Uh, we have some connective tissue between uh, these structures. We see a central uh, vein, a central sort of canal here, like we had almost in the osteons of bone tissue. And lining these blood vessels, these sinusoids, we have Kupfer cells that are going to extract debris, pathogens, damage red blood cells, and, and recycle the heme and the iron and so on that we talked about back in the section on the cardiovascular system. And these hepatocytes also produce bile that gets into the, these small bile ducts that travels back to a larger bile duct. So this bile duct, along with the hepatic portion of hepatic uh, portal vein and the hepatic artery shown in red, make up collectively a portal area or a portal triad. All these filter back or feed back to the hepatic portal vein or artery or to the common bile duct eventually. The liver has many functions, over 200 known functions, but all these functions fall into one of three categories, generally speaking. Metabolic regulation, hematopological regulation of blood, or bile production. So we'll talk about metabolic regulation just for a minute. The, the liver is the primary organ involved in regulating the composition of circulating blood. All blood leaving absorptive areas of the digestive tract, most notably a small intestine, but also anything absorbed from other parts of the digestive tract, flows through the liver before being pumped to the heart via the inferior vena cava and then out to the systems. So hepatocytes can extract uh, uh, nutrients that were absorbed from the digestive tract or toxins from the blood before they get to the rest of the body. They monitor and adjust the circulating levels of organic nutrients. Excess are removed, they're stored. So the liver can store nutrients, store them in the forms of like glycogen, for example, or even convert them into other chemicals to be stored by adipose tissue as fat. So for example, when blood glucose are, are too, lied, too high, the liver removes glucose and synthesizes the storage compound glycogen. If they're too low, the liver breaks down stored glycogen and returns glucose into circulation. So the liver is particularly sensitive to hormones like glucagon or insulin. Insulin when blood sugar levels are too high, made by the pancreas. Glucagon when blood sugar levels are too low. Circulating toxins and metabolic wastes are removed for later inactivation or excretion. And fat, sol fat soluble vitamins like vitamins A, D, E, and K are absorbed and stored here as well. Hematopologically speaking, the liver has the largest blood reservoir in the body. It receives about 25% of cardiac 
output. Remember, a third of the blood traveling via the hepatic artery proper comes directly from the heart after being oxygenated. So as blood passes through the liver, we have those phagocytic Kupfer cells that remove old or damaged red blood cells, cellular debris, hemoglobin proteins, etc., and pathogens from blood. Kupfer cells are antigen-presenting cells that can stimulate an immune response. Finally, the liver is responsible for producing and secreting bile. Bile is synthesized in the liver by hepatocytes and excreted into the lumen of the duodenum. Now, bile is made of water, ions, and remember bilirubin, which we saw as a pigment derived from hemoglobin as it's metabolized by mac macrophages in the liver. It's made from cholesterol. That gives it a lipid component. And other, other lipid metabolites known as bile salts. In fact, bile is an amphipathic molecule. It is partly lipid soluble because it's made partly from bile or from cholesterol, but it's also partly water soluble. And that's why it can interact with lipids in our small intestine and help bring them into solution. It is an emulsifier. It brings lipids into solution, just like a detergent does with your dishes and grease. It brings them into solution so they can be uh, separated and broken, broken down. Of course, our body wants to get rid of these bile salts and cholesterol. And so this cholesterol that's used is actually high-density lipoproteins. And this is why we say this is good cholesterol, because this is going into bile production. And bile is going into our digestive tract and hopefully is going to be eliminated from our waste. So it's a decrease in overall cholesterol levels. So you can see the major functions of the liver digestive and metabolic functions and other major functions. Again, it has over 200 known functions. That leaves us with the gallbladder. The gallbladder is a hollow pear-shaped organ located in the recess on the posterior surface of the liver's right lobe. It receives bile produced by the liver, stores it, and concentrates it, so it's more potent, and then excretes it into the small intestine. There is a duct from the gallbladder called the cystic duct that travels from the gallbladder to the bile duct from the liver. And when they fuse, we call this then the common bile duct. The common bile duct travels inferiorly towards the duodenum where it meets at the duodenum with the pancreatic duct and enters at the duodenal papillae that we saw earlier in uh, the chapter. There is a sphincter that controls movement of bile and the pancreatic uh, juice into the duodenum called the hepatopancreatic sphincter. So it surrounds our shared passageway. But the major function of the gallbladder is to store bile. And bile is secreted somewhat continuously, about a liter a day. But it's released into the duodenum only when cholecystokinin is present. Remember, cholecystokinin is produced in response to, among other things, excess lipids traveling from the, small, from the stomach into the small intestine. So in the absence of cholecystokinin, the hepatopancreatic sphincter is closed. So bile leaving the liver in the common bile duct, hepatic duct, can't flow through the common bile duct and into the duodenum. Instead, it enters the cystic duct and ends up backing up into the gallbladder which expands to take the excess bile. But when chyme enters the duodenum, cholecystokinin is released, relaxing the hepatopancreatic sphincter and stimulating contractions within the walls of the gallbladder to push bile into the small intestine and then helping emulsify the fat. Another function of the gallbladder is bile modification. When filled to capacity, the gallbladder contains 40 to 70 mils of bile. The composition of bile gradually changes as it remains in the gallbladder. Water is absorbed, the bile salts and other components of bile become increasingly concentrated. 
if bile salts become too concentrated, they may precipitate, and this is what forms gallstones, and they can cause a number of uh, clinical problems. In any case, that is the end of material in Chapter 6. 6.